Oh, hey there, everybody. This is Kenny and Kenny Squared with the Sports on the Positive Tip podcast. We are back after a three week or so hiatus. I don't think we've taken three weeks from doing this in the last four years that we've been doing it or so. Uh, so it is great to have you back. Maybe it's even longer than that. I'm not even sure how long. We have to look it up. Um, but it, it's it's been great. So, Kenny, first, let's um, start. We're, we're not going to get caught up on three weeks worth of sports, but a lot of things happening. We have enough, I think, to talk about of what's been happening the last week or so. Um, tell me a little bit about um, your thoughts on the baseball all-star game. Um, yeah, I did check June 29th. So yeah, just about three weeks here. Um, and it is good to be back. Um, we were, I'll just kind of recap. We went on the epic road trip across America. We went, we drove to California. Um, Shelby's grandpa's 90th birthday. Drove all the way back. You know this, but for all those that don't. Um, it was great. We had a great time. Um, and I did catch the all-star game. Where you know. Yeah, yeah, I know you caught the All Star game. Before we talk about that, what was some you you saw a couple of sports places? Um, so why don't you tell us about the places you saw that are stadiums, and you also stopped at a very special place in Kansas City. Yeah, so um, well, we took seventy back, which I didn't know this until we started making the route. Seventy has three different major league ballparks on our route, so. Yeah. We only stopped at one. We stopped at Coors Field, um, went into the team shop. Um, I bought a t-shirt. Maybe I'll wear it next week, um, if I remember. Uh, It was a Colorado City Connect shirt. I think it looks cool. Um, And then um, the kids bought bats, which did not go over as well. Um, They lost them within a couple minutes because they were hitting each other with it. So that's great. (laughs) Um, And then uh, we also kept going on to Kansas City. Um, we took the kids through the Negro League Museum. Yeah. Um, we only really scratched the surface and I'm planning a trip to take you sometime next year. Um, I have yeah. a, we'll, we'll talk offline about dates, but yeah. Yeah. Um, so it was really cool. It was really tremendous to kind of just be there and kind of see some of the history behind it. Um, yeah. We only We only did scratch the surface, but it is a really cool place. I would recommend anyone that's driving through Kansas city, going to Kansas city, check it out. Um, and then we drove by, uh, Kauffman stadium and also Bush stadium. Um, we didn't stop at either one cause well, I've been to Bush stadium, at least in the team shop, um, Kauffman stadium. I've not been to. So, yeah. uh, and they were closed when we went. So, yeah. Um, yeah. all-star game. Um, I thought it was, well, let's talk about the positive first. Um, I like some of the storylines that they kind of put in there, like the Paul Skeens. It's the first rookie since Hideo Nomo to start an all-star game in 1995. Um, and he was tremendous. It's great kind of seeing a star like that in person. Yeah. Or not in person, but like seeing yeah. him up front and close. Cause like, I mean, the pirates aren't on national TV a lot. So, oh. um, so like that was cool. Um, I thought it was pretty well paced. Um, I feel like in years past, like especially the last few years, it's been just like pitching, 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 and then some random dude that ends up winning the MVP hits a home run. Yeah. I feel like there was a little bit more offense this year. A little bit um, more, yeah. So I thought that was good. Um, the jerseys were weird, though. Um, I don't know. I like the American and National League All-Star jerseys, but I don't necessarily like them for the game. I like them at the home run derby. Right. Um, cause like, especially some of my favorite players, I like to get like the all-star game shirts. Yeah. Um, I have, I have several, like I have when they were in Cleveland, um, last time they were in New York, um, and a few others in there too, but it just, um, I think they should go back to that if you yeah. ask me, um, yeah. and have, and it seems like that's kind of the momentum and the direction they're going is like, uh, players will wear their, their own jerseys next year home or away depending on whichever yeah. makes sense oh um, yeah yeah home run derby was interesting because i did watch i watched like the second half of it yeah um and like i heard some people's reaction especially like people that were actually there 
And it seemed like a lot of people thought it was really slow. I don't know. It seems like something kind of needs to be redone with it. They tried a new format this year, which kind of worked. The ending was exciting. Um, but I made this comparison to a few of my friends, and I think it kind of goes. The home run derby has become kind of like the um, the NBA slam dunk contest, where it it's kind of like you don't get – you might get some interesting moments or some great highlights, but it's still not the – top of the top stars yeah like Aaron Judge wasn't in there and thank god he wasn't in there because the last thing we need is him get hurt in the home run derby again yeah um Otani also uh Otani isn't in there uh like even like a Mookie Betts or a Freddie Freeman or Matt Olson who hit a billion home runs last year home runs yeah, yeah um like it's been a few years since Bryce Harper's done it um so I think like and it's hard to incentivize the players because especially like Aaron Judge, Mookie Betts, Mike Trout even. I know he's hurt. He's always hurt. But um, like those guys that are making $250 million or more, they don't want to do it in, to like take money from, say, a Bobby Witt Jr. or an Alec Bohm or a Teoscar Hernandez. So like that aspect makes sense. So maybe get yeah. a, rid of the cash thing. I don't know. Yeah. I heard um, an idea of, kind of doing it similar to the way that they do hard knocks where certain players can't say no unless like there are specific um like there are specific things in there so like um if you got injured or if you've done it the last couple years but like um i've heard of other formats too like um this was a few years ago where you always have to have a hometown guy um you have to have like the major league or the al and nl home run leaders of that year last Mm. year's champion um and you have like automatic bids this was oh that's right this was when um robinson cano didn't pick i want to say it was eric hosmer when it was in kansas city remember when they used to have captains and they had to pick teams yeah Um, Yeah, yeah so like that that got everyone mad so when robinson cano came up everyone booed him like hey whatever so i don't know i think the home run derby needs some revamping i think the all-star game itself is still by far the best one in all of the uh, major sports. Oh, not it's even the close. most like, yeah, it's like the most realistic to what the actual game looks like. Cause the NBA, it's not, it's not anything close. Football yeah. is not anything close. So yeah. I think it's still a good product. Um, and I think like even the voting process, sometimes I have issues with the voting process. I didn't really have any, like, man, this guy really needed to be in it this year. Brandon Nimmo was the only one I had uh, from, but I'm, I'm a little biased. Him and Lindor, I thought, but I don't, I didn't know. I also didn't know who you could take off. Um, So go back to the uniforms for a second. Now is he, uh, so I hated them this year and I had gotten used to them a little bit the last few years, but they, they looked like a softball league, you know, um, uniforms this year. And I, I I thought I was just being too old school when it when they first did that and it hasn't been that long right it's only been a couple of years that they did that they've been doing it for the all for the home run derby for a while but I mean up until a few years ago right they were still wearing uh their uniforms uh you know yeah I want to say like 2021 was the first yeah. year yeah so it hasn't so they could change that I, I hope he does I think he's heard the feedback. Uh, I think the commissioner uh, of baseball, Manfred, I think he um, I think he listens to the fans. I'm starting to get that sense, you know, with some of the special things baseball has done and speeding up the game. And and, you know, now there's so much talk about uh, really, you know, uh, umpire robots and, you know, kind of uh, getting back to I know they were doing it before in some of these leagues with they have a piece and the iPhone is picking up, you know, if it's a strike or not. I think he listens to the fans. So I think that he's going to hear the fans was like, yeah, you know, I, I'd rather see my hometown guy. You asked the question, well, how would you change the game? Um, and I hadn't realized that they did this. And I don't think John Schmaltz realized it either. When Tory, it was Tory Lavello who did this right. in like the eighth inning, one of the guys, I want to say it might've been the guy from the pirates or the Padres came in. And he only, you know, faced two batters and, um, and he was allowed to take him out, unlike in the regular season. And I didn't realize that that was a, they changed it, you know, for the game so they get more pitchers in. 
more players in. Um, I don't like that. I, I still don't like a pitcher coming in uh, uh, every inning. And I get that you want, I mean, I was looking for my hometown guy, right? As old as I am, I was still excited that, okay, it's Pete Alonzo. When's he playing? Now he didn't get in the game until the bottom of the eighth inning for defense. And then he strikes out the one time that, that he batted. Um, but I think that these guys that now, I mean, how many guys are throwing a hundred miles an hour? seems like every guy that came in is throwing like 99, a hundred. I'd like to see the starter back in the day. And I, I don't mean to sound like an old fogey, but back in the day, the starters would go three innings. Um, and I think that was the max. I don't think there's any max anymore because ain't nobody going more than an inning or, or in some cases, a few batters. Let's just, so I would like to see Skeens come out for a second inning, you know, um, and let him face at least six batters, uh, you know, before, I don't know that you can put a rule in like that because there were times where I think it was the 77 all-star game when it was in the old Yankee stadium that had just got remodeled and it reopened. Right. And Jim Palmer started for the American league and everyone was expecting him to go three innings because back then that's what everybody did. But uh, the national league tattooed him in the first inning and, you know, uh, they took him out, uh, you know, after a few batters. I think the National League was up already three or four to nothing, you know, against him back in the days when the National League would win all-star games. Um, you know, so I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know that you can mandate that change, but I don't know some of these guys that you'd like to see them go more than an inning because they're pitching so well. I don't know how you get everybody in, but maybe you just still don't have to get everybody in. Maybe get in. Maybe get in the guys – again, I don't think you can mandate this, but maybe get in the guys that there's only one player from the New York Mets, and so I've got to get that player in, you know. And, oh, my gosh, there's – how many Phillies was in the game? Eight Phillies, I think, was in the game and are named to the team. You don't have to get all of them in, you know. Maybe get one of the guys in that's never, you know, played in the game before. There was also a time here I, – I so I think this – and. And this isn't totally original. I forgot who I heard maybe suggest this. Uh, who were the top vote getters? Was Aaron Judge and Otani? Were they the two, or was it Judge and Harper? I think it was Judge and Harper. Judge and Harper, right? yeah. I, I'm sorry, man. I'd like to see those guys all nine innings. You know, play those guys. If you're the top vote getter, play all nine innings. Play the whole game. You know, and I know, you know, um. They're better now. They don't leave the bench. A lot of them stay on the bench. But some I didn't see Aaron Judge after he was taken out. I'm sure he got on the first plane to go, you know, because when uh, Ortiz, uh, which they could do away with that segment, by the way. Uh, I like Big Poppy, but him going in the dugout, you know, trying to – because some of those guys had no idea who he was. They're like, who, yes, you know, like Gunner Hinder. <laughs> he thought he still had another bat, you know, uh, Gunner. And Gunner was like – he said, oh, you're going to hit one out next time out? He said, well – uh, in, in my next game that I play, um, cause I'm out of the game now, <laughs> you know, they can do away with that, but I would like to see the top vote getters, you know, play all nine. In- Again, I'm sound like an old fogey, but Willie Mays played the whole game back in the day, you know, and they would, they would lead him off so that he could get more at bats, you know, because they knew fans wanted to see him, you know, it's a different time, right? Because you didn't see Willie Mays much unless he was on the game of the week or whatever. So I don't know. Um, um, can I can I add something yeah. in there? Please, yeah. I I don't know if it's possible, but maybe reducing the roster would help. Like, yeah. I don't know if they would do it. Because, yeah. like, let's say in theory, obviously you got nine guys. Well, ten if you're saying also the DH. Right. You got ten guys starting. And usually there's overlap. Like, Philly's had multiple starters. The Yankees had multiple starters. The Guardians had multiple starters. So, like, that's always going to happen. Whatever a good team is, like, obviously they're good for a reason. Um, but I think if you limit the roster a little bit, even if yeah. it's by, like, so you don't have 8,000 pitchers, right? like, that'll kind of extend it. Because, like, I remember 2004. Um, back then, it was standard to for the starter to go two innings. And usually the next guy in was going two innings. Um, but it was shocking because the American League shellacked um, steroid user Roger Clemens. They, I think they put up six runs, if I'm not mistaken, in that one. 
Yeah. And yeah. to the point where back when they didn't have a DH in the American League and like the pitchers were hitting, um, Tim Hudson got in that bat in an All Star game. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So, like, it, I don't know. It. I agree. Like, it is a lot because there's a lot of pitchers out there, and it's yeah. always a new one. And part of that is, yeah, like you want to get everyone in. You need your rando Colorado Rocky in there. But like, well, yeah, yeah uh, definitely, yeah. yeah. But also, it would stink if, let's say, like, let's say your only guy was Edwin Diaz next year. And right. hopefully that's not the case, but, and he only gets two outs because you got to get another rando dude. It, to me, they can do oh, something different. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, they, they were, I love that they saved, this is a, uh, now it's been a couple of years, right? They saved class A for the save to put him in, in the ninth inning. You know, I, I, of course he's the best closer. How many years did Mariano, he probably holds the record for most all-star saves because they would always hold him off till the ninth inning and, and put him in. And it was his game to close out, you know, um, I, I think, I think if, and this, I don't know, again, you can mandate this, but let's say it was Ryan McMahon, right. From the Rockies only guy there, get him in the game relatively early. You know what I mean? Get him in the game, like in the fourth or fifth inning. Um, and I know uh, Alec Bohm, that was his first all-star game. So you don't want to maybe take him out too quick. Right. I'm talking about both third basemen, but you want to get this guy in the game relatively quick. I think if it's, like we had Pete Alonzo, he shouldn't just get one at bat in the ninth inning and that's it. You know, uh, we went through that a lot uh, for several years in the seventies. We only had John Stearns was the only all-star and they put him in just to catch the ninth inning. He wouldn't even get in a bat, you know? Um, I just think that, you know, the, those things can be suggested to the manager. I, I like the idea of reducing the roster a lot. I, I don't like the idea of not having at least one representative from every team because I just remember as a kid how I felt when my guy came up, you know what I mean? For an all-star. And I still felt that way all these years later. I'm like, where's Pete? You know? Oh gosh, Freddie Freeman. All right. You know, you got to play Freddie Freeman for a couple of innings, you know? Um, it, but, and, and getting Alonzo in the game really kind of kept or on the team. It kept Christian Walker out of the, off the team. And, and he's having a much better year than Pete. I, I just, I hate to say that, but he is, you know, um, but I just think that add a little more common sense to it. Um, the top vote getters, we want to see them. You know, I, I would have loved to have seen Aaron Judge coming up, you know, in the eighth or ninth inning uh, and, and Bryce Harper, you know, coming up. But maybe you got to clear it with those guys. You know, maybe that's not a rule. Say, hey, you're the top vote getter. Uh, can I play you all all nine innings? Judge would probably say, sure. You know, probably Harper also, you know. Um, yeah. You know, I, I don't know. That's just me. Well. Um, and I think you had some good suggestions there. Get rid of the uniforms, though, man, next year. I think he will, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm like, and I understand why they exist because of, like, it's merch. I saw a kid at the farmer's market today with a Guardians uh, all-star hat. But, like, also, and I also like how it's, like, it matches whatever team is in there. But I feel like it didn't this year. No. Like, the bright neon red isn't really the Texas. No, no. No, I, I hated to admit this. There was uh, one or two players that came up and I didn't know what team they were on. You know what I mean? And I had to look for their patch, uh, Paredes, right, from Tampa. And I knew him, but I, I just couldn't place it, right? And I said, oh, this guy's a good hitter, right? What do I know? What teams he ought to get? And then I finally, you know, when he turned around, I could see the the Rays patch on his on his arm. But other than that, I, you know, and I'm sure I wasn't alone, you know, because I think the All-Star game will attract folks that aren't following the game every day, you know? So I don't know. Um, anyway, it was a really good game and I liked the timing of it. <clears throat> I think it could get better. I liked that it was a little bit later, like it was a week later this year for whatever reason. Um, so truly, you know, when they always called it the midsummer classic, not really the middle of the summer, like the first Tuesday or second Tuesday in July, you know, uh, for some reason it was a couple of weeks. And that's what they used to do because I was seeing how on this date in, in baseball history, there were a lot of all-star games played a little bit later in July. Um, so now we're back to business in baseball. And I know you, I, I thought this was great. You asked um, contenders, pretenders. Um, but first, I, I want to say, I think your Yankees have righted the ship a little bit because before the all-star break, uh, they came that close to sweeping the Orioles. It was a heartbreaking loss that Sunday. Um, but they did take two out of three 
take that and run with it because they hadn't won a series in what seven or eight series, something like that. Um, and then they came out in one last night, scored six runs against Tampa. Um, what what's your sense now of the Yankees? Have they turned the corner here, or do you need to see more? No, I think they turned the corner a little bit. Um, because something else that was it just kind of seemed weird because they were getting hits, but it seems like they weren't producing runs. I feel yeah. like that happens a lot. Like I feel like there was a couple weeks there it was like nobody's hitting. Yeah. Um Volpe's in an awful slump. DJ's in an awful slump. Uh and you got like rando dudes in, plugged in there every left like Ver- Verdugo was doing awful. Yeah. Um but like you have like your rando dudes like wait, why is this guy getting four at bats? Um so I think they've righted the ship a little bit. Also, the starting pitching was like it seemed like everything just went down at the same time. It's like the starters were doing so well. Luis Hill was gonna eventually hit a wall, like you knew that was gonna happen. Um Rodon, Stroman, like they were all doing really well. So you knew there was gonna be a couple of bad stretches in there. Um yeah. but it just it's accentuated so much when the hitting was so bad too. Um, so it seems like the pitching was is starting to turn around. Cole had a really great start last night. Um, so I do think that they are turning it around. And I also still think that they need a couple pieces. Um, let me pull this up here because the guy that, I don't know, he might be, in, he's starting to really become the man, for whatever reason, he got old, a really quick guy for me, is DJ LeMahieu. Um did yeah yeah he's had some injuries though to be fair you know yeah yeah um and so he's batting 182 um people were ragging on trent grisham um trent grisham has a better batting average right now than dj lemayhew not by much 188 but also he still has zero home runs and like lemayhew's not a big home run hitter um but like he's got a 275 on base um, and a 482 OPS. He's slugging under 200. And, and like, I know to some extent you got to keep him out there because he didn't really have a spring training and everything like that. But at some point, um, you got to cut bait with him. Or he's got to become like your defensive replacement late in the game. You plug him in wherever. Because, like, he's killing the bottom of the lineup. Yeah. 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 Um, so I'll, I'll get to the Mets in a second, but let's stay, let's stay here for uh, a, a minute. Can the Yankees depend actually on um, Rizzo and Stanton? I mean, what's their status is and um, can we depend on them? It's really well past the second half. Now I think, I think all most teams have either 90 or less than 90 games left already. Uh, because the All Star Game was a little bit later, uh, what's your what's your thought there, and what are you feeling right now? We're still a little bit away from the trade deadline, and I know we're going to talk about contenders, pretenders in a little bit, but what's your sense in terms of what the Yankees really need at the trade deadline, and and do you think Rizzo and Stanton are going to come back and help? I I'm more optimistic that Stanton would come back and help more than Rizzo. Um, I think it'll take Rizzo a little bit longer to kind of get back into game shape. Um, and honestly, I kind of like Ben Rice in there at first base. He he hasn't been like spectacular. He's had a few excellent games, three home run game a couple weeks ago and everything like that. But um, I do like Ben Rice there. He's been kind of the leadoff hitter off and on yeah. the last couple of weeks. So um, yeah. I don't know. Cause also they're going to be slow with Rizzo because of his injury history. Maybe so is Stanton too, but I think Stanton was actually like Stanton was doing better than Rizzo, so I think he will probably be more plug and play. Also, like the DH, sometimes the Yankees are a little like backlogged with DH, and and you're like, um, man, Stanton's just taking up space there. Now it just yeah. kind of seems like they don't have anybody else to put there. Like today, yeah. Soto's playing DH, which is great. Like you're getting him back in slowly. Um, and like they've been doing a pretty decent rotation, but Jemai Jones at one point was the DH, and that's not yeah. Good. Yeah. Um, as far as what the Yankees need, I would say if I can only have two things, 
I would say give me um, another contact hitting infielder, like a guy that can hit like 250, 270 um, with speed, even if you never hit a home run. Like get on base for the big bombers and also play like pretty good defense. Yeah. Um, and then uh, a bullpen piece. Um, yeah. Okay. That dude from Oakland, and we know Oakland likes to trade guys, looks really nice. Wow. Well, um, yeah. Yeah. And and they probably will try. I mean, if they're smart, I hate to say because I I I I never like when a young team has an up and coming star like that, and they're almost forced to trade him. And he still has five years of control. You know, Mason Miller, we're talking about. But I, I understand this, right? If they trade him, uh, it, during the trading deadline now, and they almost hold on to him, and almost until the last hour, that they'll probably get players that they can build around it's always i hate to use this word but it's always a little bit of a crap shoot right roll of the dice because you just never know but uh the washington nationals when i think about uh every once in a while this works out because the guys they got for juan soto when they dealt him to the padres with cj cj abrams who's an all-star this year James Wood, who is a budding star, uh, who's up and is doing well from out in East Hampton, by the way. And uh, Mackenzie Gore, who's doing extremely well as a fit. So they got some pieces that they could build on down the road. doesn't always work out that way. I'm sure for every one of those, you could probably name five or six of guys that they traded that are still in the minor leagues, you know, or never made it to the majors. But I think um, – Miller to the Yankees can do the Yankees still have the prospects to get him. Like, I mean, there's going to be a lot of teams that'll bid for him. What do you think? Uh, probably not. Um, yeah. they traded him off with like, Soto. Yeah. Cause like they could, um, there are two that are probably out there that you'll hear in trade rumors, probably up until the deadline. Um, one is obviously Jason Dominguez, who, although he's hurt again now, he's probably not going to be back till September. Um, but I don't think the Yankees want to trade him. Um, especially like, I think Dominguez is kind of their Soto backup, if that makes sense. Um, but I think the other one that's probably a little bit more expendable is Spencer Jones, who is another like power hitting outfielder. Like people compare him like size wise, power wise to Aaron judge. Well, they'll, Um, they'll be that would take him yeah definitely yeah yeah but i think one of the if you look at the yankees in terms of like they have a lot of guys that are coming off the books um one that might be useful for somebody and i don't think it would be in oakland would be glaber torres i'm kind of done with glaber um he's had an awful year yeah uh let's see what's he been he's been 231 yeah uh with eight home runs 35 rbis yeah like now i'm not asking him to be a 30 home run hitter but like that's one thing the other thing is he's so awful on defense sometimes and right that's surprising to me yeah Yeah. so like i don't know for me i think he needs a fresh start i know we had talked about the who says no waiver for Jeff McNeil. Right, um, right, right. Which the only thing, if, if contracts were the same, I'd do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I do wonder too, like in the right deal, do you trade closer for closer and trade Clay Holmes? I don't think that helps them though. No. I think they need Clay Holmes to become the eighth inning guy and getting like a shutdown closer. Closer, um, right. Right. If you asked me in December, I would have said, oh my gosh, trade for class A, but they're not doing that. The yeah. Guardians have no reason no. to do that. No, not not with the year they're having. Um, and Jeff McNeil turning it around a little bit. He was hitting a little bit better right before the All-Star break. Came out last night, hit two home runs, um, which I'm, I'm not crazy about because sometimes he gets home run happy and he's not a home run hitter. But um, And he had another hit and he had a walk and he had made a great catch in right field. Um I, I think the Yankees will be fine. I, I, you know, would you take back like an Araldis Chapman and put him in the eighth inning? I'm sure the Pirates are going to trade him. No, nah. no. <laughs> wow. He's, I mean, yeah. he's too, he's too wild. He's inconsistent. Like, he is, yeah. 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 Like 
and I don't know. He's yeah, I think I just think he's too inconsistent. Like he would work better in the eighth inning because then you can bring in Clay Holmes to pick up his mess. But also yeah. sometimes Clay Holmes gets a little wild. So uh, here's a guy that I th- I'd love to see the Mets bring back, but um, he also obviously uh, had some great years with the Yankees. David Robertson will probably be up for the taking. Um, I think at the deadline, unless Texas really turns it around here, um, that'd be a guy I think you plug into the eighth inning and keep Holmes in the ninth inning or vice versa. You know, um, I, I think, and he's still got, I think a year, a good year or two in him. Um, I, I'll, let me get, take a minute on the Mets and then I'm anxious to hear your thoughts on contender pretender. And, and granted th- this may change after the trading deadline, right? But I, I just I feel strongly about some teams that are pretenders right now and um, and and teams that are contenders. Uh, I a bad loss last night for the Mets. I mean, they weren't not like they were behind. Uh, Sean Manai, I can't blame him. He's pitched extremely well all year. He had a bad outing yesterday, uh, but the Mets left a lot of guys on base, um, and that was um, and I thought it was a bad play sending. Um, sending Iglesias home in the uh, eighth inning when they had second and third with one out and um, and they had the infield in and Bader hits a shot to the shortstop and he throws a bullet right to home plate and he's out by quite a bit. Um, and that really killed a rally right there. Um, but that's okay. I think that, uh, and I don't know if I mentioned this too, you know, the Mets had the same exact record in 2015 at the all-star break that they that they have uh they had this past year and then they they got Yoana Cespedes and then it was all over. I don't expect them to make a trade like that um at the deadline. But if they all of a sudden go on a losing streak, um, you know, last thing I wanted to do because it would be very, very easy. I've said this before, I'll just say it real quick. The Mets have a bunch of guys that a lot of teams would take in a heartbeat. And the uh, reason for that is that they're they've been good. And also they're on one year contracts. So I'm talking about Pete Alonzo. Pete teams will line up for him, I think. I don't think the Mets will get a ton back at this point. Um, but also I think Severino, uh, Manaya is on a two year deal, but I think it's a player option. Um, uh, and both have been great uh most of the year. Maybe great's a little strong word. They've been extremely good, much better expect than expectations. Uh Harrison Bader has had an excellent year. Um, I mean, there's guys that teams would want and the Mets could, it, it was miserable last year when they traded everybody away. It really was. It just was like, although maybe that cleared the clubhouse out a little bit. Cause you know, word got out after that Verlander and, uh, and Scherzer weren't good clubhouse guys, uh, when they got together, but I think the Mets will make, um, a few moves and maybe bring back, uh, I'm thinking two guys, one or one of the other that they'll probably bring back. Uh, that they trade away at the deadline last year. And one would be Tommy Pham. I think they take him back, even though he, you know, he trashed the team a little bit on his way out. I think they take Mark Canna back in a heartbeat. Um, and and both those guys are probably going to be traded again at the deadline. Um, but the Mets need relief help. Um, so I, I'd like to see them make a move for a big time reliever uh, that can, you know, shut down the seventh and eighth inning. Um, their bullpen still isn't that great. But overall, even though they lost that last game against the Pirates, I want to say, uh, Nationals, um, but right before the All-Star break, and then they lost the first game coming out, I'm still happy with them. I think they need to bounce back and win these next three games against the Marlins. All right, so I'm going to say my contenders first, and then I want to hear your contenders. Um, I think the actual contenders are the Mets. I got four teams, two in each league. The Mets, and if and it's been kind of under the radar. The Diamondbacks have been playing really good, and they got Montgomery and Rodriguez coming back. Um, So I want to say that the Diamondbacks are contenders now again. They know what it takes to win. I think they have an excellent manager. Um, I've always liked that team. They've got a really good young core. Uh, Cattell Marte, uh, you know, starter in the All-Star game is a star. And now the other two American League teams are your two least favorite. (laughs) that I think, uh, oh, in my opinion, watching them, I think they're both contenders. And one would be the Red Sox. I mean, the I can't, where do Red Sox keep getting these good young players from? You know, this Jared Duran, I mean, this guy is, he's amazing, you know? Um, and I know Devers has been hurt, but 
when he comes back, they've got quite the lineup, and their pitching has been so much better than anybody thought. Um, and I hate to say, man, you're at the, your team, the Astros. I, I can't count them out. I mean, this might be their last hurrah because they've got some free agents coming up. But I, I would say in the American League, the Red Sox and Astros are, are legit contenders. What say you? Who are your teams? That, and I know you hate that I said that, but who are your teams that you think are legit contenders in both leagues? Yeah, I mean, we could easily go on with like Phillies, Dodgers, Brewers, but that's that's not fun. No. No. Um, yeah. I think a team, two teams to look out for. Uh, number one is the Pirates. Oh, um, okay. All right. Like, imagine the Paul Skeens leading the team to, he's probably going to win rookie of the year. I mean, I know he's only had like, what is it, 10 starts or whatever, but he's probably going to win rookie of the year as long as he doesn't get hurt. Um, yeah. But imagine them kind of taking a step where they can sneak into the final wild card. Um, be maybe fun. upset, maybe like upset the Brewers in the first round because the Brewers always lose in the playoffs. Um, that that might be fun. Another one is the Padres. Um, they've had weird clubhouse funk the last couple of years. I'm not pointing the finger at Juan Soto because he's been great in the Yankee clubhouse. But like something has been off with that team. They had the talent. Tatis is there for a full year. He's been really good defensively in the outfield. Machado is still there. Jerks in Profar, he's one of, I think it was like 11 guys that made their first all-star start um, after the age of 30. Yeah. Um, and yeah. some of those guys on the list are like Babe Ruth, who didn't make an all-star team because the all-star game didn't exist. Yeah. So, um, so like he's had a really good year. And they have pretty good pitching. Like, you Darvish is good. Musgrove is good. Like, I can see them kind of doing stuff. Um, as far as the American League goes, I hate to say the Astros, but I would also agree. Um, to me, you can't count them out until, like, out number three in the ninth inning, and they're going home sad, and they're banging trash yeah. cans the whole way. Yeah. Like, they are still there, and it pains me to say that, because, you know, they lead the division now. Um, cause no one likes the West. Yeah, they, they, did they overtake uh, Seattle? I didn't realize that. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Um, the other one I would look out for is Kansas city. Um, cause yeah. they had, they really revamped their rotation this year. Um, Bobby Witt jr. Is going to be like one of those, Ooh, is he a dark horse for MVP? He's not going to win it, but, um, yeah. although you never know, maybe he will win it. Um, but it kind of seems like uh, they're a team that's kind of ready for that next step. And also, like, the Guardians are there, and they're going to be really good. Are the Twins going to continue to be good? Um, yeah. They're kind of sometimes there, sometimes not. So yeah, um, I could definitely see Kansas City kind of taking that next step. Okay. All right. I like that. Um, you know, I have I have my list written here, and, you know, I have right in the middle – See if you agree with me here. I have in the middle of the town. I'm going to tell you the pretenders in a second, but I have in the middle of the Texas Rangers. I have no idea what to expect from them. That's been such a weird team this year. And, you know, Bruce Bochy, it's, it's hard. It's so hard to go back to back to, you know, uh, and, and he, I mean, think about his three titles with the Giants. They didn't never want it back to back, you know, they every other year. Um, there's always this letdown. It seems like Texas has had this letdown, but they're getting some guys back and they may get DeGrom back sometime in August. Um, I think if DeGrom comes back, he knows he'll beat DeGrom. You know, he's not, he, he's very careful when he gets hurt. He knows he doesn't come back unless he's hundred um, percent. And and so I, I don't know. I, I don't know what to make of them. I don't know if they'll be sellers or buyers or they'll just keep their team intact. Uh, there's talk of Nate Evaldi, you know, going to other teams. I I just don't know. I think right now they're four games under 500, something like that, three or four games under. Um, five. They're five games under. But like you said, that division, though, is for the taking. And so they could go on. I mean, would any of us be surprised if the Rangers won 15 out of 20 games? You know what I mean? I just I wouldn't be that surprised. So um, I have them right in the middle. Here's my pretenders. I think this year is not going to be the Tampa Bay Rays year. And and I always think Tampa somehow is going to pull stuff out. 
I just don't see it with them this year. I think they're going to sell off a few of their players. Even a Rose Arena, they're talking about, you know, uh, trading. Um, uh, uh, Miton, the Mets already got, which I was surprised that uh, that they dealt him. And he's been a really good addition to the Mets bullpen so far. Um, I don't see, I think this is just not their year. I think they had too many injuries in their starting rotation, even though they have really come back and they're hovering around 500. What is it? Their game under maybe right now, um, you know, which I mean, they were 12, 15 games under earlier. Um, I don't, you know, the other team and they've been weird uh, for several years now, but I think, I don't think they're going to do a big sell off, but I, I think they're a pretender and that's Toronto. Um, I don't, I don't think they're going to trade off Guerrero or, or Bichette. I, I don't see – they might peel off one of their pitchers. Like I could see Chris Bassett going somewhere else, you know. Um, but I think they'll keep their core intact and say, let's just, you know, uh, let's go for it next year. I think they'll probably get a new manager. Um, but I just don't think it's their year. I, I really don't, especially in this division. We talked about this, right, early, that it was so important for the Yankees to get off to that great start. And thank goodness, because they hit the rough patch. They got the injuries, but they're still right there, right? I think in this division now, recovering in the second half for Tampa, Toronto, nearly impossible. Um, now, I'm a little different uh, because I watched that team very closely when they played the Mets. There's still something off with the Padres. And I, I like their manager, but they should be a lot better than they are. Now, I don't know if you know this, because this has been kept on the cover. It's almost like the Andrew Wiggins thing a few years ago with the Warriors, how he had to leave for personal reasons. You know, Hugh Jarvis, Darvis has been gone from that team for a little while now. Um, and they, yeah. haven't, they haven't said the reason why. It's not an injury. They say he's dealing with a family matter, and they have no idea when he's going to be back. Without him, I, I really don't see them making a run into uh, the wild card. None of those teams are going to catch the Dodgers. The Diamondbacks are, are the Padres. Um, I, I don't think the Giants are going to get into it this year either. But the... Um, the Padres I put as a pretender, you know, and here's the reason why. The, the the times they played the Mets and watching that team, they still don't hustle. They still, I, I mean, Manny is such a talented player, but he, there's just something off. Maybe he's, and he's clearly their team leader, but maybe there, maybe it's him though that is setting a bad example on that team, you know, because Soto's not there anymore, as you said. Tati strikes me as he hustles all the time. Now I think he didn't go to the All Star game because he was hurt, right? But um, but he was named an All Star. He's having another great year. There's something off with that team, even with this new manager, who's a very good manager. Um, I think that they're a pretender. I don't see them in the postseason. Now, will they make a few moves at the deadline? Well, their payroll's been a little constricted. You know, because they signed a lot of guys to huge contracts. Um, so we'll see. But they're they're my other pretenders. So I got Tampa, Toronto, and the Padres. Who are your pretenders? Um, well, you said a lot about Toronto. Um, I was also gonna add Tampa to that list too, but you already took yeah. care of that. Um I don't know, you can only do but so much of like the crazy stuff with analytics and the really cheap stuff without without like a hiccup here and there um you know it would be a good spot for tampa would be trevor bauer but that's not happening um but either he's way gonna, i would he's gonna that? sue he's gonna sue baseball you just see that coming don't you oh yeah absolutely yeah, um, yeah, no um the other one and they are like um the other one the american league because they are good, but they've blown a double-digit lead for the division in the span of 24 days, and that's the Seattle Mariners. Um, I can see them making a big splash. Like, It seems like it would fit Vladdy going there, um, mm. and he would fit that team really well. Yeah. Um, but I don't wow. know if they're going to do it. I could see them making a big splash, and then maybe they can get back into it. But as currently constructed, like, it's also kind of the mindset of we had the lead, we had the lead. Oh, no, the Astros. We can yeah. never beat them. Like, I feel like it's a very big mental thing, and I think it's going to hurt them. Yeah. Um, 
Because even Texas, like Texas won the World Series, but they had to do it as a wild card because they couldn't beat Houston. Yeah. Um the the National League, there are so many teams. Um one, two, three, four, five, six teams that are either tied or within four games of that last wild card. Um, I'm gonna pick two because I I don't know. Something kind of seems like I feel like they're missing a piece. One shouldn't be missing a piece, and that's the San Francisco Giants. Yeah, you got Blake Snell. I said at the beginning of the year that I thought they had a really, really good offseason. Yeah, but yeah. I don't know. Um, yeah. Blake Snell has been awful. Um, he has, and he didn't even sign that big of a deal. But he has probably had the worst contract signing all year, like I of any know. player. Yeah, um, I picked him too. Remember, I thought that they had the best top two uh, guys in the league you know, uh, with him and Webb. So I'm with you. Um, so I think Snell is, um, has been a big part of that, but I can't really see them doing the other team that I think is still missing a piece, but can be really exciting, especially because they have a very exciting player. And that's the Cincinnati Reds. Yeah. Um, Ellie De La Cruz. I saw a video about how he basically every time he gets on base, he tries to steal a base. And I love that. He is so exciting. He's like one of those players that like if he's in the playoffs, people are turning in tuning in because he's in the playoffs. Yeah. And we need guys like that in the playoffs. Yeah. But I feel like the Reds are missing a piece. Yeah. I don't know if it's more of a bat. I don't know if it's more. I don't know. Maybe it's both. Yeah. I still can't really peg the NL Central as a whole. Um, like who the heck is leading? The Cardinals are leading. Like, no. The yeah. Brewers are leading. The Brewers are leading, but yeah. Like the Cardinals are in second place. Like it just, it seems like an odd division. It so is. I don't know. One of these teams has to be left out. And I think it's going to be the Reds. Yeah. I, I, I think the Reds are totally pretenders. I, I didn't put them on the list. I, I don't see them as a contender though. You know, there was also, I thought you were going to mention this. There was, um, I didn't see the pregame show, but they had uh Cruz on there and he's, he's learned how to speak fluent English. And he just felt like it was important. They asked him about that, but then kind of in the middle of it, he said, I got to say this. And, you know, he's sitting there with Derek Jeter, David Ortiz, and Alex Rodriguez. I mean, you know, uh, that's quite a panel. But he looks to Jeter and he says, you were you were my idol, my favorite player when I was growing up. And Jeter was like, wow, okay, you know. And I'm sure a lot of current players uh, uh, will probably say that. But he gets the chance to tell him right right there on national television. I thought that was a really cool moment. Um, I, I You know, how do you think this is going to affect the trade deadline? We'll jump to the NBA after this, but I'm curious your thoughts. Cause there are so many teams, you know, if I'm the GM of the Reds, I, I might be thinking I'm a piece or two away. See, for the Reds, I think it's, it's pitching. Cause I think the Reds offense is going to be fine. Um, you know, and I think it's also ironic. It's about the division and we like Craig console. I think he's an excellent manager, but it's amazing. He's the, the highest paid manager. And what are the Cubs doing? You know, and, you take it from the Brewers, and now what are the Brewers doing? You know, uh, but anyway, um, how do you think all these teams being in contention in both leagues is going to impact the trade deadline? Because it's really only a few teams that we know are definitely going to sell, right? The White Sox, the Marlins, um, so, uh, probably the Tigers, the Angels. Um, other than that, I mean, if you're the Reds, are you selling? Are you going to trade Jonathan India? I mean, when you're kind of still on the cusp, probably not. You know, Hunter Green, no. It, uh, I'm I'm holding on to this guy. You know what I mean? How do you think it's going to impact the trade deadline? Um, I don't think we're going to see a ton of trades among a lot of different teams. I think yeah. it's going to be a lot of the same. Like the Marlins are dealing everyone. Chicago, the White Sox are dealing everyone. Which side note? Um, I saw this. Uh, Chicago might be having the worst sports season in their history. Um. The Bears finished in last place. The Blackhawks finished in last place. The Bulls finished in like last place in their division. It's been a rough year for Chicago's fans. Sorry. But I mean, you got Caleb Williams, so you'll be fine. Yeah. 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 Uh, the Bulls are going to be awful, by the way. We'll get to the NBA in a second. Yeah. Um, again. Um, but like, I think it, it's going to make it good and bad. And it, it, I think what's going to happen is it's going to add more pressure to push back the trade deadline. Because some of these teams like that are three games under 500, four games out of the last wild card. Like if you're the Cincinnati Reds waking up this morning, um, you're four games under 500, three games out of the wild card. 
what makes you think like, oh, well, if we win five out of our next six, we're going to be right in the hunt. Like, a lot, I feel like that's going to happen with a lot of teams. Yeah. But yeah. if you say like August 15th, a lot of those teams that were kind of close are to start to see some separation. Yeah. Um, which will be good because I think it like, I think it's going to be good for baseball because like, I mean, speaking to a Mets fan here, once Scherzer and Verlander and half of your team got traded, like you didn't feel like watching baseball anymore. You're like, all right, let's Aaron Rodgers to the jets. Let's go. Yeah. Um, yeah. so I yeah. think it'll help kind of keep more teams engaged, which will create, like, imagine the chaos where you can have eight different teams making the last wild card, the last weekend of the season. Um, which like baseball, look, I would love to see that. As long as the Yankees have clinched the division, we don't have to worry about the, the stupid wild card weekend. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's yeah, I don't know. I don't know if you're gonna have a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I like. I that's a really that's an interesting suggestion. Pushing the deadline back two more weeks. Um, because you know it used to be June fifteenth years ago. <laughs> you know, it used to be in mid June. Um, and then. I think it was mid July for a little while. And then it, it hasn't been a long, long time that it's been the end of July. Um, that's really, really interesting. Interesting thought, especially now with the, the extra wild card and you got all these teams packed together. It's great for baseball though. Like, you know, Cincinnati there. Um, what team did I see already had um, is El Cleveland or already had over a million in attendance and they're like, they're killing it. It's in their pack. Oh, you told me that. I think that they're packing the yeah. ballpark every night. It's almost like the nineties where they had around seven or 800 straight sellouts um, back in those times. I was, um, it's good to see baseball revitalized uh, there and they're an exciting team too. All right. Let's spend just a couple of minutes on the NBA and then we'll get to inspiration. Uh, a lot happened over these last several weeks. Um, I mean, I was sure that Jalen Brunson was going to wait to sign his extension so he could get, you know, over 200 million. And he didn't, he really set the Knicks up nicely. Mikhail Bridges, the Knicks land. I think we talked about that. That was right before you left. Um, and uh, Cameron Payne campaign, um, you know, the Knicks landed uh, who was another big piece that Phoenix should have never traded away when they got Durant, um, you know, so I think he's a good piece coming off the bench for the Knicks. Uh, Precious Achua, I think it's a no-brainer to bring him back. I'm not sure why the Knicks haven't yet, but they still have that hole at center that they haven't really filled. Uh, Mitchell Robinson, certainly when he's healthy and when he's playing, he's he's excellent, you know. But it's just keeping him on the court, so you really need you really need that good backup. Uh, what's stood out for you uh, with some of these NBA moves over the last few weeks? Um, I guess I'll start with the Jalen Brunson thing. Um. I wish more players did what he did. Cause I don't know. I, I don't know if it was a direct quote or like people were saying, Oh, this is why I did it. I think he is looking at the example of your Tom Brady, uh, yeah. who was never the top paid player in the NFL and yet won seven Super Bowls. Yeah. Um, I know people slam him for it, but LeBron James, when he signed with Miami, he could have gotten a max deal, yeah. but by taking less, he was able to add, both Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosch to the heat roster. Right. Um, so I think Jalen Brunson has really set the Knicks up for long-term success. So like if another star is looking to come here, it provides that opportunity. Um, good for him for like, he sacrificed like $114 million that he could have gotten. Is, so, he the, is he the most popular New York athlete right now? I think it's between him and Aaron judge. Would you say Brunson is is right there? Is he more popular than Aaron Judge? Ooh. Uh, ask me again in October. Okay. If Judge wins a title, because yeah. I would say Judge slash Soto. Well, it depends on how the, uh, the playoffs were to go. If the Yankees win the title and Judge is like a big part of that, wins World Series and or ALCS MVP, I think it'll be Judge. But Brunson is right there. Well, if the Knicks won a title, haven't won since 1973, Ken. You know what if, I mean? So, yeah. If Brunson wins a title, regardless of what the Yankees do, Brunson will be. Uh, yeah, he will forever. be like 
the face of New York. Yeah. Um, did I say, I don't know if I sent you this. Um, I saw a thing that someone said that Brunson has already passed Carmelo Anthony as a Nick. Do you agree or disagree? Well, Carmelo, it was so mixed. I, I, you know, I hate to give a slow answer on this. Um, I'm going to say I, um, I agree because there were, you know, this, there were, a, a, there's a good chunk of the Nick fan base that really despised Carmelo Anthony, you know, uh, despised him when he was playing for them and, you know, didn't want to make that trade. Um, I, you and I are a little bit different. We, we thought that he was, um, you know, we, he was the only big star back then that wanted to, to come to New York. Nobody, everybody else turned Nick's out. Amari Stoudemire didn't. He came, right? But uh, LeBron James, nobody that back then. <laughs> Chris Bosh, all these guys that Knicks was supposed to get. Um, so, but I, I would say Brunson is is much more popular. Brunson has a different work ethic, I think, that really fits New York well. You know, he's he's gritty. Um, I think there were times where people thought Carmelo didn't work as hard. They thought he'd come in out of shape. He never came in chiseled, you know, and everything like that. Um, and Carmelo really was a scorer, man. He was just a scorer. Where Brunson gets the whole team involved, you know, um, he only scores a lot when he knows, hey, there's nobody else going to be able to score. So I think Brunson already has has passed him in New York basketball lore. Um, the guy that I would compare him to right now, Ken, uh, for the Knicks is Latrell Sprewell. I think Sprewell mm. had this popularity with Knicks fans that, and I don't know, maybe it was because, and I hate to say it, maybe it was because of what happened in Golden State with him not taking any stuff from his coach, which I think was totally wrong of him to put his, you know, hands on Carlissimo like that. But but he, you know, he had the swagger with the braids in his hair and, you know, he brought something different. You know, he was much more, he wasn't as good a player as Allen Houston, but he was more popular than Allen Houston, which was strange. Allen Houston was a little bit of a vanilla type player, great jump shooter, you know, very steady. Sprewell kind of had that fire in the belly, sort of like Jalen Brunson has. So I think, you know, Larry Johnson a little bit, same way. Anthony Mason, uh, God rest his soul. The, I, I think Brunson compares to that era a little bit more to, than to Carmelo. But right now, I think he's right there with Aaron Judge as the most popular athlete in New York. Yeah, I would agree. Um, and yeah, imagine if both the Knicks and the Yankees help break this yeah. uh, 12 year yeah. title drought, 100 seasons in New yeah. York sports. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I what guess what if, um, Russ to Denver, I think, is one of those moves that's going to look like it's like people are going to inflate it more just because it's Russell Westbrook. But I don't think it's going to affect too much. I mean, right now, you would say Denver's one of the top contenders. Obviously, Denver, I think Dallas yeah. probably is still the, the team that would oh. be most likely to get there because of Clay Thompson. But um, I don't know. It kind of, and when I'm thinking about it, the last few weeks in the NBA, I feel like the biggest story has been, um, what has Bronny been doing in the summer league? If I'm honest, yeah. which like, it's not a to big, me, it's I, making it a bigger story than it is really. I mean, none of these guys, yeah. the guys didn't do well in the summer league, you know, but yeah. Well, like I'll give my two cents on that. Number one, like, it is his first like live action NBA. I know it's summer league, but like NBA action, people are always rusty. Like when Manana didn't do like amazing stuff and yet he still won rookie of the year. Yeah. And also he is still like, there was this reason why he was passed over twice or he was passed over like 54 different times. Like it, he is still a project. He is still developing. Yeah. And I think people just need to let him develop and yeah. not expect him to be like, his dad day one. No, it's not going to happen. No. Um, I am excited about some of the uh, Olympic stuff. It kind of seems like for the first time in a minute, yeah. like the U S is taking it a little bit more seriously than they have. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, like um, I heard someone say like every other team doesn't have a guy. Their second best player would not make our roster which I think is probably true. Cause like you've got guys like Luca Jokic SGA, but like 
the second best player on any of those teams is not making the U.S. roster. Heck, yeah. Jalen Brunson should be there, but we won't we won't go there. No, uh, you know, Derek White is there instead, but you know, instead of Jalen Brown, um, you know, that's a whole other story that we could talk about maybe next week. The whole Nike thing with Jalen Brown and there's no way that Derek White should be there. And Derek White's a very good player. Don't get me wrong. Um, he's not better than Jalen Brown. And I wouldn't even put Brunson ahead of Jalen Brown right now, you know? Um, but anyway, um, no, I agree. I think we're going to have some stuff to talk about with the Olympics. Uh, I, I really do. Um, not just the, uh, the basketball, but I think some of the other sports is going to be really intriguing Shakari Richardson and a few other things, Simone Biles, how she does. So I, I think, I think we'll have some stuff to talk about with the Olympics. Yeah. 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 Let me get last, last quick NBA thing from you. And then we'll get jump to inspiration. Um, Paul George to the Sixers. I don't think I ever got your thoughts. Oh, that's right. Yeah. I knew there was something else. Um, I think it does move the needle for the Sixers, but I don't think it puts them over the top. Um, and also still the biggest question for them is health. Tyrese Maxey's there and he's excellent and he's great. Are you going to have Joel Embiid for a full season? Is Paul George going to be there for a full season? If both of them are there, Paul George fits that team so well, it could be kind of scary because now they have an excellent point guard, an excellent wing player who also defends really well and an excellent big man. That's hard yeah. to defend. Yeah. I mean, yeah. However, in the Knicks, they have two of the best uh, defensive wingmen out there with OG and Mikel Bridges. So I think the Knicks would be oh. fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it doesn't answer the question of if they're going to be healthy. I feel like the 76ers, it's, they have a really good roster. Back Remember back when Ben Simmons was actually good. Wow. Like they got him. They got Joel Embiid. Like they can be unstoppable, but no yeah. one can stay healthy. So, yeah. Yeah. um, Paul George, put yourself in bubble wrap and wait till opening day. Same with Joel Embiid. That's that's really good the way you put that. I feel exactly the same way. And you know, I've always felt this way about Paul George. I I don't know why he gave himself the nickname Playoff P. He never did anything in the playoffs, but um, he's such a wonderful player. And it's just a shame that he has so many injuries. But if he's healthy, that's going to be a dangerous, dangerous team. It really is. Um, All right. Let's jump to some inspiration. Um, I will jump first. Mine's a little bit different, and I don't know why this popped up for me the other day, but and on July 28th, 1993, uh, a terrible record was set by one Anthony Young. Anthony Young was a pitcher for the Mets. He was a starter and a reliever, and he actually became their closer when John Franco got hurt. Um, but he set the record that I don't think anybody's going to break. He lost 27 games in a row. Uh, over the course of two years yeah and you know Dallas Green was a hard-nosed manager God rest his soul uh he managed both the Yankees and the Mets and um you know he he's one of the few managers that got, that got fired because he was a little bit too tough on players he got into a screaming match I think with Jason Isringhausen and uh in the next few days he was let go you know um but he was hard on Anthony Young Anthony Young was a talented pitcher and um In 1992, he was a closer, but he also started some games. His record that year was 2-14. and He had a 4.17 ERA, and he had 15 saves, though. Um, And I think Franco got hurt somewhere in May, June time frame, and he took over as a closer. But they would, back then, doesn't seem that long ago, they would bring closer in maybe seventh, eighth inning, you know? So, um, you know, instead of just a blown save, he was getting the loss. In 1993, though, man, he mostly was a starter. He went one in 16, with but he only but he had a 3.77 ERA. It was like every game oh. was. I mean, the Mets, the Mets were just not a good team then. Uh, that was the Bobby Bonilla. Uh, they traded him at the deadline that year, but that was the Bobby Bonilla, Eddie Murray, Brett Saberhagen, Vince Coleman. Um, you know, team that totally underachieved, and Anthony Young. Um, you know. Uh, Jeff Torbor got fired uh, the year before uh, Dallas Green takes over and he just keeps putting him out there, putting him out there. Poor guys losing games two to one, three to two, you know, because the Mets just couldn't hit. And he wound up 27 long when he finally got the one win. 
he had just this great saying where someone asked him, hey, do you feel like you got the monkey off your back? And he said, monkey? I got a whole zoo off my back. <laughs> you know, I thought that was a, a great line. But the reason why he's my inspiration um, is, and, and that 27 losses, 14 of those was as a starter. 13 of those losses was as a reliever. Um, I, I, that's Ooh. hard to do. That's hard. Was, relievers don't usually get a lot of losses. You know, that's that's hard to do. He was just this unassuming guy. After every loss, as he was getting closer and closer, everybody, the whole press was around his locker, and he never was angry. He was always very polite, and he says, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to break for me. Uh, he was just, he was a guy that was so easy to root for. Uh, he was so unassuming, and he used to say, I'm just grateful to be in the major leagues, you know. But he's now forever. I don't think anybody's gonna break that record. Um, he's forever kind of known as having 27 losses in a row. Tragically, only at the age of 51, he uh, developed a brain tumor. He let it linger. By the time doctors got to it, it was in a very late stage, and he passed away uh, several years ago at the age of 51. Not many years ago. I think it was 2017 or 2018. But just the way he conducted himself um, during that time, it stood out for me. Uh, Anthony Young, definitely uh, my inspiration today. Wow. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. Um, well, it's funny. Well, not really funny. Um, the connection of brain cancer to my inspiration here. Yeah. Um, I, I'd seen a social media post and I thought it was really good. Um, it was a, like, it was done by MLB. They found this family where son died from brain cancer and then a few weeks later um dad was diagnosed with brain cancer and another one of their children were awful awful situation so they go and they um they're like hey um whatever it was i think pure life or some type of water company i was like we're giving you guys ten thousand dollars to help with like medical expenses and like life essentially and then they were like, well, we have more for you. Um, we also raised an additional $50,000 for you. Wow. So um, they were at that point, they were like really shook. And then they were like, well, we actually have more for you. So um, you're a baseball fan, right? And the kid's wearing an Astros jersey. Um, no shade to the Astros in this segment here. Um, yeah. And he's like, yeah, my favorite team's the Astros. Who's your favorite player? Kyle Tucker. Kyle Tucker rolls up and has a box for them. And um, in the box is uh, American League All-Star jerseys with their name on the back in 2024. And they were able to walk up on the red carpet for the All-Star game and got tickets wow. and all the whole nine. So that's so cool. Wow. Really wow. good story. Um, wow. it, it's one of those moments where I realize how much baseball can help bring healing for people. Yeah, I know yeah. like, it's not going to distract them from the fact that they have a very serious fight in front of them, yeah. but it can at least like you look back at that type of memory and you're like, wow, this is so cool. Um, yeah. This is not related, but a story with me, I told Isaac, I think I texted this to you. Um, Cause Isaac's really latched on to the guardians and also um, Trevor made him a book for his birthday about his first baseball game and like yeah. had pictures and such. Um, so Shane Bieber's in it. So Shane Bieber is like low key, one of his favorite players. So I told him, yeah, you remember, you won't remember, but I do. Um, the day we came home from the hospital was the all-star game in Cleveland. And in that all-star game, uh, the American league shut out the national league and it's very typical. Um, but the MVP, I believe he struck out the side, if I'm not mistaken, was guardians ace Shane Bieber. So when wow. I told him that he was shook. So yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so cool. Wow. 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 I, I love when, um, back to your Kyle Tucker story. I love when, um, stuff like that happens. You hate when tragedy strikes like cancer, brain cancer, but, uh, I think baseball still does a great job with that. I think it was like the fifth or sixth inning where they do the stand up to cancer thing and they all stand and everybody writes. And, and it's, it's a shame because everybody knows somebody that, is either going through now or they've lost to, you know, to cancer. So they raise a lot of money for that every year. And, and it was so good to to see that. I might've glanced at that story um, 
sometime in the when they were showing highlights of the pregame show. I think that's great. Um, all right, I have a quick recommendation for you. Um, I watched the first episode. There is a new miniseries documentary, sports documentary on Netflix, and it's called Receiver, just like they did the quarterbacks that we like. Oh, yeah. And they're they're following along a few receivers, uh, uh, Debo, uh, Samuel, uh, George Kittle, Ama St. John, uh, from the Lions. Amon Ross St. Brown, yeah. Amon Ross St. Brown, yeah. Um, Although he wasn't in the first episode, I think Devontae Adams, who we're hoping is going to wind up on the Jets, but I don't know that that's going to happen. And there's one more that I'm forgetting that they have in there. But anyway, I, I watched only the first episode yesterday, and uh, it's very good, very compelling. Gives you a little bit of insight into the mind of a wide receiver and how important they are uh, to the game. So I would definitely recommend check it out. And if you do, we can come back together and talk about it. I think it's like seven or eight episodes. Um and we can uh, maybe talk about it in the coming weeks, which we'll be certainly talking about the Olympics, trade deadline, a lot of great things happening over these next couple of weeks. Yeah. Yeah, I'll yeah. check it out. All right. All right. All right. Ready to take us home? Yeah, let's do it. This is Kenny Squirrel. And Kenny. With Sports on a Positive Tip. We'll see you guys next time. Absolutely.